Hello, everybody. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong, and welcome to Brain Club. Let me share screen and get us oriented. What you wish people knew about autism. We're kicking off April. We'll talk about April in a minute. But first, um, I'll orient you to Brain Club in general. Um, Brain Club is our education space for the collective ABB community with the purpose of providing education about neurodiversity and related topics of inclusion. Through Brain Club, it's our hope to bring people together um, based on a shared vision of what's possible and contribute to systems change by shifting social norms. And then you go out into your world um, and spread the good word. This is a place where people can come together to collectively learn and unlearn what no longer serves us. It's a place where we're hoping that you feel safe right from the very first time. And for many people experience something that's quite different from the outside world. The idea being that by, by being um, part of a community and by promoting new ways of thinking and being, um, that's, that systems change. This is for uh, education purposes only, though All Brains Belong has a lot of different types of programs. Uh, this one is not for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group. This is a, um, a collective education space. All forms of participation are okay here at Brain Club. You can have your video on or off. Even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or interact or <laughs> anything, any, you know, do what needs doing, walk, move, fidget, stim, eat, whatever, whatever needs doing. And you're welcome to communicate however you are most comfortable. You can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat. You can also send private chat messages, or questions that way. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, we protect the space here by asking that if you are bringing up anything that is distressing to you, we ask that you discuss the impact of those experiences, not the details of the events themselves. Um, that's just part of balancing individual versus collective needs. Um, and so um, uh, more, more access needs, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon, but if not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to make sure I have the chat box open and here it is. It's already open. Look at that. Speaking of the chat, the chat is a, a great opportunity to practice negotiating and navigating conflicting access needs where many people need different things that conflict. So the chat box for many community members is um, a, a way of accessing this program. It's a way of being able to communicate without mouth words. Um, it eases working memory because you can just blurt out your ideas as soon as they come to your brain. Um, it also allows for processing time where, you know, you might hear something, think about it, and then five minutes later, you have a thought about it and you just throw it in the chat. Um, so, and of course, that there's there can be direct engagement back and forth between community members. There are other folks for whom the chat is really distressing. Uh, there's visual clutter. It's distracting when it pops up. Some people even have a startle response when it when the chat window pops up, or sometimes it moves really quickly and that's distressing and hard to follow. So um, I would say that the main the, the main event is up on the screen. So you can if 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 you can ignore the chat box if you are in uh, camp two, um, wonderful. If not, there are some ideas we have. So um, if if you're someone who the chat bothers you after the first pop up try not closing the window. This way when new messages come in, it'll replace the message, but it won't pop up. So it, maybe sometimes that becomes easier to ignore. You also could disable chat preview. So here's the what the chat box looks like on your toolbar. You can try clicking on the up arrow next to there and it'll 
show you the words show chat previews. If you tap on that, it'll take away the check mark and now you won't show chat previews. I hope that helps. Okay, here we go. It is April for many people. So first, let me just name this. Like April is quote autism awareness month. Um, as though like we're not aware of autism. So um, autism awareness month or autism acceptance month or whatever. Um, there's a lot of autistic people who find April performative and obnoxious and all of it. So if that's your experience, I'm glad you're here. Solidarity. So uh, what we have chosen to do um, with, with April is make Brain Club this month be about autistic culture. Um, Lizzie, can you can can you uh, pop the link to our Instagram video from yesterday? Um, I reposted a video yesterday from last year um, about uh, uh, with some commentary on April. Um, but we're going to do it differently here. So uh, today we'll be um, I, we're going to be replaying a community panel recording um, from last year that is hands down one of my favorite Brewing Club panels of all time. Um, we'll be able to we'll have the opportunity to hear from a panel of our community members um, who learned that they were autistic later in life, um, anywhere from their twenties through their sixties, and we'll hear about about what that experience has been like. Um, I'll also name that later this month um, is our third annual Shifting the Autism Narrative, the Impact of Stigma on Health. So if you've, uh, it, 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 you, you might see some emails getting fired around around like a separate registration. If you've registered for Brain Club on that day, it's the same link. You don't need to register twice. Um, but this is, um, this is an annual presentation that we do to like name the thing about the healthcare system's role in perpetuating the stigma of autism. Okay. Um, so uh, without without further ado, uh, David will play our panel and just wanted to think think in advance our panelists, Kelly, Amy, Sarah, Matthew, and Zeph for sharing their experiences. Okay, go for it, David. When did you learn that you were autistic? And what has it been like to get to know your brain? I only recently like had somebody else say, hey, you're right, you're autistic. Um, <laughs> so it, I don't even think it's been like six months that I've like comfortably said it to other people like and feeling confident like, no, I got someone backing me on this. Right. Um, but I have always question my neurology because because of the things because people do the things so easily and it always befuddled me like how I mean just in school how do you just walk in on the first day of school and and just do the things and not and not be freaking out like you know, how does that happen when I knew I was autistic, I was late diagnosed in, uh, in January uh, after my physical, which is age 23. Okay. And that was, you know, when, you know, the SSI and SSDI program wants to make sure that, you know, to continue, I had to go to a psychic, psychiatric to continue my benefits. And that was, you know, through the per healthcare provider and that was by law. Mm -hmm. um, and that experience, and I found out that I was autistic then, but like I said, I've also had multiple disabilities that, you know, ADHD when I was young, mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, dyslexic dyslexia within that ADHD, form and then you know cognitive speech issues stuttering of my own words mm -hmm. uh that is when i knew i was 
different, you know, thinking differently. And my brain was working very differently and it sees the world in a different, you know, spectrum, but I sees it in a different place, you know, of its own, you know, its own reality and mm -hmm. its own kind. Mm -hmm. And my brain, you know, I actually love my brain the way it thinks because I can see the world around me, but also I can see the world in me through other people and see their experiences, discussions, difficulties, and, you know, conversations through a whole different set of lens. I first heard the idea or um, someone asked me specifically, like autism was not on my radar at all for myself. And, um, but I had gone to see um, one of my spouse's college friends who I didn't, I had never met before. And um, I wasn't a person who like shared a lot about myself, but I found through the weekend of hanging out that I um, was sharing a lot. I was in a really challenging time in my life. And um, it turns out that two years prior, they had been diagnosed with autism. And so um, the last day we were hanging out, we were in this really, really large uh, restaurant um, and in New York City. And it was really, really loud and tons of people. And um, but we had gotten to know each other enough that it was like there was this comfortability. And in that conversation, that's when they had said, like, had you ever considered autism? And no, I had never, and I don't, I like, it didn't even cross my mind. I had very like stereotypical ideas of what it meant to be autistic. Um, but they did this thing that like really changed my life. Um, they put noise canceling headphones on my ear, on my head. Wow. And they did it, like they put it on. And so there was something in the act of this connection with this person. And when, when they, Put them on i think that they could see a shift in me um it was so palpable to have all of the stimulus and in that connection with them in that moment it was like the whole world like went away for a moment and i think it was like really in that moment i knew and even though i didn't know know and and but I got excited and I got really curious. And I had come into contact with a blog or something that was written about the alien on the playground. And it was about an adult diagnosed um, assigned female at birth person who felt very alienated throughout their childhood. And I read this um, blog and recognized myself in it. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was partnered with somebody who had been diagnosed with Asperger's, which is a part of the spectrum, but that's what they were calling it when he got diagnosed. And I found the RADS Ritvo scale online, which is a clinically validated assessment tool. It's correlated between people who have autism and people who don't. And I took it and he took it and my results wound up being even farther off the charts than his were. And that started me trying to get attention from my medical care professionals that I suspected that I had autism because um, it says on the RADS Ritvo, if you score in this range, take this into your doctor to be assessed. I worked for about a year and then wound up in a space for about four to six weeks where I just couldn't do anything. And and around this time, I was I was I would consider myself an autistic burnout, and I I couldn't really leave the house, and I was having you know, up to 10 panic attacks a day. Like it was just my nervous system was just, everything was shutting down. And um, that was right when the lockdown happened. And so um, it was like, it saved my life. It felt like in a lot of ways, because now all of a sudden there's no um, social interactions. I don't have to hug anyone. 
I don't have to set any boundaries for myself. I don't have to be anything for anyone. And it was, it's when I came out of, um, I realized I had been an autistic burnout. Fundamentally, it took me, it took me another couple of years to actually get diagnosed with the autism, but reading that article that enabled me to self-diagnose and really started asking the questions was kind of like this kaleidoscope twisting into focus where everything that never made sense about my life finally started making sense. And I've been suspecting that I was autistic for a long time um, or, you know, 10 or t 10 or at least 10 years, maybe. Uh, and I'm 60, uh, a little over 60. So, um, so I guess there it's, what it's, I think the thing that's been the most important to me is really sort of finding a community of people. Right. About a year after that, I found ABB going into the Fox market, a little market in um, East Montpelier, and they were donating tips to All Brains Belong for that month. And when I saw that, um, this is the place for me this is like this is where i get i'll start being able to exist in the outside world because that still wasn't part of my experience and uh abb to me has been a way to have community have social connections to understand my body to reframe mental illness into you know autism to to um take medicines that you know simple medicines that have been able to make my mobility and my um ability to be in the world different and um so i would say like the my therapy gave me a space to um be myself in a way to to myself and abb has given me a way to be myself and in community with others um that I hadn't had in so long what does being autistic mean to you Honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is trauma. Um, you know, I don't want to be a downer or anything, but being an undiagnosed autistic for most of my life, I've had a really hard time with social trauma. I've had death threats as a result of me not understanding either social cues or what people are saying. And um, I have CPTSD that my psychiatrist has identified is as a side effect of having autism. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it basically means that my brain has differences in the way that it works and processes information. There are some things that it does really well. There are some things that it really sucks at, um, but Fundamentally, I don't look at my autism as anything that needs to be cured. I look at it as a part of the natural standard deviation in terms of what is normal. Uh, if I had to guess, I would say, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, that most of us are probably really, really wired to be incredibly sensitive to social context and social cues and what the, what the rest of society um, wants and, and needs and what other people are doing. And in a large way, that's great. It helps us to all get along. But if a whole society is off base, um, then or going in a direction that isn't so good, evolutionarily, there probably needs to be at least a, a healthy minority of people that are able to like, not be so wired cued into what the social world thinks. I think that's healthy for society to have that minority. And I think it's really hard to be in that minority because that difference is not at all appreciated in the mainstream. Um, can you talk a little bit about the strengths and the challenges that you feel like go along with being autistic? My biggest, you know, brain strength is insight and knowledge, you know, a world around me, plus the environment, if it's toxic or welcoming, and you know for me that's my that's my biggest strength is you know my brain is thinking fast on its feet and how and the way it sees the world's perspective view 
my brain's weakness is is trying to comprehend or doing doing too much overriding comprehending the situation mm -hmm. and trying to analyze it in its own way but there's too much you know background brain status noises that it makes it hard for my brain to comprehend on what to focus on i'm really really good at things like pattern recognition i rely upon pattern recognition for survival um i'm also really good at working with things that are really complex um i have an ability to see both the forest and the trees at the same time guess what it means to me to be autistic is like to sort of be the moral a moral conscience or a, a sort of a, a, a an outlier to the rest of society saying uh, outlaw, uh, an outlier or an outlaw to the society I'm living in be saying, I just don't see it the same way you do and it doesn't make sense to me and I think you're going in the wrong direction in this way and that way and this other way and that you could be doing it. And, and so it's and so I'm often on the on the outs of it. And yet, you know, 20 years later, I'm often not wrong. So um, and it's a long time to wait. And by the time everybody else is caught up, I'm usually on to finding something else that I don't like. <laughs> so yeah. we're just people understood things that I just didn't seem to understand. And I didn't know where they were getting the information. You know, like had Google existed as as if I was a child, like I would have been Googling that all day long. Like, why is it so easy for people to do this stuff? Like, yeah. you know, all throughout school, I was a solid like I loved the middle of the school year. Like <laughs> you're in your groove, you got your notebook that's already half filled in, you got the rest to go. There's no beginning of the year icebreakers. There's no end of the year zigzags. You're just whew, on your path. And I've always said that about myself. And now I can kind of like look back and be like, well, duh, yeah. Like, <laughs> of course, of course that makes sense. Like, it was comfortable. I knew the rules. I knew the expectations. That's when I tended to be more engaged in class because I just, I understood the expectations, but beginning and end of anything is just so challenging for me. Um, uh, I can feel like I'm nervous um, to talk and that's like part of it is like the excitement. It can cue on safety in my system. Um, and, um, and so I just want to like name that for myself. <laughs> all of the ways that I had felt different um, or been made to feel different around like pickiness, being overly sensitive, controlling, highly anxious. Um, uh, even though I had, those were all kind of separate points or relationships in my life, all of a sudden it came into this clear view under this one umbrella of, uh, of this, um, you know, neurobiology or this difference. Um, I think of it differently now, but, um, and so in that exploration of that, um, so I had always was, you know, very sensitive. I was always um, shy. Um, it was really hard for me, but mainly what I was discovering was I had an inside world and I had an outside world. So I would go into the world and I would try the best. I would study um, human behavior. I was very adept of understanding and really sensitive to energetics within how people were leading, which was often very confusing because I could tell if someone was dysregulated, even though they were acting like everything was fine. But in my social environment with my peers, it was really difficult because I could sense when someone was was challenged, but if I pointed that out or I was direct around it, it would often get turned around like something wrong with me or. That I've had to work really, really, really hard to actually care about other people mm -hmm. and to actually, and, 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 um, and to, um, and, and to, uh, uh, and to, and to connect with other human beings and to, so, so I, the, the challenges are I, I often get in the way sometimes of good things and maybe many times of good things that other people are trying to make happen mm -hmm. just because it doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. sure. 
and just because I don't understand why it works for other people. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's sometimes hard to know when it's really important to take a stand and when it's just like I'm being stubborn and I don't like being left out and I want to do it my way. I'm exhausted all the time of all of the thought and all of the effort that I have to do in advance to be successful in the future. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see other people doing that. Like mm -hmm. my husband can get up out of bed 10 minutes before he's going to leave the house. And he's just, and I'm like, are you kidding me? I get up at like 5 AM, even if I'm not leaving the house, just to like prepare myself right. for the day. I need to, <laughs> I need to ease into my day. I can't just get up and and go painful it's like oh i'm always because you know and, and it just it's the reality of being autistic it's, it's like like i'm always i that's just how my brain works it does it works differently right. than the culture than most of the people in the culture i am in and i believe evolution designed it that way and what i this a thing that i think i would love to see our culture change is the way that we deal with outliers because i don't think outliers are mistakes i think outliers are necessary for a society that needs to be self-reflective and the, the best of humanity is kind of self-reflective. So it, it, I, I think outliers are a good thing, not, not, a, not, a, not a mistake of nature, even though you know, they slow down corporate production. How is your life different since learning that you're autistic? All of a sudden, like by saying, by started saying I'm autistic and, and learning about the autism community, all of a sudden there's this whole group of people that's like, oh my God, instant sort of social connection mm -hmm. that um, otherwise I would sort of find piecemeal um, case by case. Um, uh, um, and, you know, it's, you, I mean, you still have to make friends, but at least it feels like you're, it's, a, a, it's like the community itself is, has the feel of human community, the kind of human community I've been looking for for an awful long time. I'm glad to know because it gave me more grace with myself mm -hmm. and it also just connected my son and I a little bit more, you know, when I told him, he was like, well, of course, mom, that makes so much sense. You know me so much more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I guess it does kind of make sense. Again, I'm the tree, you're my little apple, you know? But not being diagnosed as a child, like I went, had to go back through my life and in the grief of that and realizing like, oh, I always cut paper. Like I would just cut paper all the time. I realized, oh, this where's my stems. Mm -hmm. You know, I watched t a ton of TV. It's where I got all my social understanding. Mm -hmm. um, I was often like really, um, like physically my face would change. Like if I was hanging out with somebody, I would start speaking like them. I would start, um, I would take up their interest um, and, but then I would go home and just be very um, able to be in my own world, listening to songs over and over again. Um, and so when I was taking the quizzes, it felt like someone was entering into my world. Like, how do they know that about me? How do they know that I have a fascination with running water? How do they know that? Like, it was like someone was peering into my soul and I felt known for the first time in my life, just from, just from reading the questions. So um, at the time I was in tremendous amount of uh, internal struggle. And so I think what happened for me was I, I entered into that world. And so I became very quiet and very curious about myself for the first time because I realized there was this quality of dissociation when I was going out into the world. Um, and I was really doing a lot of work to try and undo that. And to, but I didn't have any awareness of my body. I didn't have any like ability to like self-reflect in the sense of like, I could self-reflect it, like how did my behavior affect the other person, but I had no ability to reflect how am I actually being affected by what's happening? And there's a really big difference in that for me. Um, and so I think that was the first time all of a sudden sounds were coming in. And so I wasn't just getting unconscious pain from it. I was actually getting very conscious pain. In fact, my husband one time said, are you getting, is this getting worse or is this getting better? And I realized for me internally, it was getting better, but how I was living or how I was acting that out was getting worse for the world. So much of what they're saying is wrong with my kid are ways that I am, are ways of my being. 
And so I bring that up. I'm like, you know, I think he actually does that because I do that. You know, like that would make sense to me. You know, I, I'm a stay at home mom. He's with me all the time. Yeah. Of course he's going to do that. Yeah. And um, they're like, well, that isn't a thing that, you know, neurotypical people do. And I'm like, oh, that's fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, and, you know, then I met Mel <laughs> and things yeah. just went from there. And, you know, me receiving my diagnosis was such a difference from when my child received his. We were, and I mean it when I say we were literally handed a box of tissues when they said he's autistic. Well, he's on the autism spectrum. Oh. Here's your box of tissues. And like oh. my husband and I are both like, great, thanks for the answer. Like next step, you know, what do we great. do? Right. And when Mel told me, she was just like, congratulations, you're autistic. Yeah. And I um, what do you wish parents of autistic children or the broader community knew? Oh, what do I wish parents and the order autistic community broader knew about me? One, I wish they knew that we're all in this together as individuals that, you know, that sees things differently, hears things differently, and moves things differently. Mm -hmm. To me, the broader public that are, you know, parents and autistic individuals that knew about me, that I'm very, very compassionate, supportive, and I do take a leadership role when necessary to support those individuals that may not have a voice. They may not even know how to speak, you know, with their voices, or they may not understand what we're talking about because that's not that's not the way our brains act re in reality work you know everybody's brain is thinks differently and acts differently and for the autistic community uh it's about you know understanding other people's brains works mm -hmm. and how to connect with that brain and a mean and having a meaningful conversation and discussion within that brain pattern of an autistic individual, whether it's parents or children, it's just having that conversation with them makes them feel like they're welcome and and a bigger part of the not only a bigger part of a picture, but a bigger part of a family together. And that I would like to see more of is that value and welcoming sense of we're all in this together. We all help each other. Let's move forward together so we can, you know, be the best we can be to educate others about, you know, our special strength. What do you wish parents of autistic children or the broader community would know about what it's like to be autistic? I think I touched on that also. I just think yeah. it's like change the perspective on outliers. We're necessary. We're let's embrace the let's let's as a humankind let's embrace the outlier perspective for what we can learn from it and for what we can learn from seeing life through the eyes of the outlier through the eyes of outliers that we would never see because that we that we would never see because of the nat the natural bias of the majority. And uh, and 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 the natural and the perspective of the majority and how the majority is going is is wired literally wired to see things differently, and so as a culture, if we sort of embrace the idea of the of the the, the value the social value that people bring is broader than economics, and we need to bear the burden, or, or the we need to gain the benefits and bear the burden of of a of a diverse culture, then we need to find a way to support everybody um, emotionally, socially, economically, and make space for all of us and, um, and, and, uh, and, 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 tr and truly, and, and, and be truly committed to the guess that each person is trying to, each person's spirit is trying to have them offer the, the, the world they live in. One, I wish people just understood that our brains were different, period. It's not something that we can control. But two, don't 
pathologize the differences and don't pathologize and or ostracize us because we are non-conforming. But less of a tragedy, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. it isn't like, yeah. I, I made it to 46 years old all the while questioning, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I experienced the very classic, you know, when I told certain family members, are you sure, you know, you, you have, you have like college degrees. I'm like, yeah. The thing that I would love like people to understand is that, um, first of all, what I'm speaking about today is like my own experience yeah. and that I think it's really important to understand that everybody, um, gets to have their own experience and their own access needs. And even though there may be like traits or characteristics that overlap, that is not actually the experience of being autistic. Uh, being autistic for me means being unto myself, being individual and allowing myself and whatever my needs are, or whatever my sensitivities or whatever my extraordinary abilities be. And it gets to be a collection of my human experience. And I think the other thing in terms of like what I would want like the broader community to understand or what I would want my family to understand or parents of 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 autistic people um, family members of autistic people is to that. Um, that. It's so important to allow difference to be a wonder and allow yourself to be different within even your relationship to someone who knows themselves to be different and to be curious and to ask questions and to, instead of presume because I could be having a really sensitive um, sensibility right now to a noise that's happening and if there's an assumption of what that noise is that was not going to help me but if there's a curiosity around what does that feel like in your body or could we identify what the sound is it's such a radically different experience for me and so i think um for me like even like my you know my face is all red i'm really flushed i'm super nervous i want to be here part of that is my excitement but part of it is having the attention on me of like how will i be perceived you know am i safe but also just like, that's not an easy way for me to exist if the tension is directly on me. Like I've got to find another way or I get to observe the experience. And so I think it's just really important that folks know and understand that there's no one way, but the more curiosity you can have, less presumption around what people's actually experiencing, it could be an opportunity for openness. Oh, wow. Sierra said in the chat, um, what a great sentiment to end on. Yeah. for all of the people, myself included, who've, who have felt so alone and so other, it's amazing to have heard from these panelists and to see so much resonating with so many people in the chat as we listened, like imagine if we all knew each other, right? Um, millions of people around the world. So much again to Amy and Sarah and Kelly and Matthew and Zeph. Yes.
some of the other things that, that stood out to me in that video were like the themes um, that Themes of things that that were commonalities, but also, you know, autistic people are not a homogenous group by any means. Um, but hearing, um, you know, what it's like to have a lens to understand your own experience and the transfer the transformative power of that. Um, and I'd love to love to hear from from others um, who, what 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 that what it's been like to either be exploring how your how your brain works or discover how your brain works and 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 what impact if any that has had on on your self narrative. Hello, hi, hi. Um, I was actually diagnosed with both autism and ADHD uh, this past fall. And I'm still kind of trying to move past the idea that, like, there's, I don't know how to put this, but because I was diagnosed late and because I, you know, generally got the thing with AFAB kids getting passed over because they just fit this traditional quiet and feminine studious mold I think it's like I was sold this message of neurotypical success like oh you're going to move out at this age and you're going to have some kind of high paying job in an office somewhere and you're going to be able to drive a car freely and I'm still kind of unpacking these ways where like hey, this isn't achievable for everyone. It's not going to be achievable in some ways for me. And so I still have these negative internalized messages um, that are really largely the fault of an holistic targeted system. Like if you can't achieve these milestones, then you're less actualized as a human being. But, you know, I think reaching autistic communities like these have... Um, finding disability justice uh, organizers and writers all over the place. It's really helped with that. Um, one thing I also noticed is that I was kind, I was pleasantly surprised by how much of the autistic experience is sort of mix and match, so to speak. Like I have pretty good social skills by autistic standards, but then with sensory stuff, I need more help. Um, and I, it's, it's really refreshing compared to, like, either you're a low-support white guy who works in tech or you're a literal child and, and who needs a lot more day-to-day -day help. And I think there, it's so cool to see just so much human breadth. And I think, in general, this idea of human breadth and variation is, has been a great help to me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, and, you know, what, what stands out to me about your comments is that, you know, systemic ableism runs deep. And when you get the message that there's one right way to be a person, that's going to take its toll on someone's nervous system and on their self-concept and of, of, of everything that comes from there. And that these are the kinds of themes that, that, that we work on unpacking here at Brain Club. Like Absolutely, Sierra. Um, I just, I just want to say, I, you know, I, I think, um, I just wanted to bring it back to one of the points that I think Amy made in the video about how, how amazing it is to kind of go from that kind of internal reflection and knowing yourself and showing up as your true self to yourself, and then being able to like present that to other people, and I think you know, one of, one of my favorite parts of being in this community and working with this community is like how, how exciting it is to see autistic joy when people, you know, when, when you're masking, you're masking the, you know, dysregulation behaviors, but you're also masking some of that like excitement and joy and being able to see people show up with kind of the full representation of what autistic joy looks like is like the best thing and something I think we just don't, we don't necessarily get always if we're not, if we haven't, if we haven't learned that. 
Yeah. Because it's been, it, it's been criticized, actively shamed, like all of it, all of that. And for those of you who were here, it, I think it was just last week, right? We did book chat last week for, on, on, on um, Devin Price's new book, um, Unlearning Shame. And we're going to do part two of that book chat in May. Um, but this is, it's all part of this. like to share about what your your process of learning about your brain has meant for you in your life either in the chat or with mouth words because i'll speak up <laughs> um lower my hand speak up um yeah i discovered in the last couple of years, my ADHD, I always suspected. Um, and autism was once I got into sort of this world and started listening a lot. And I had a friend who went through burnout. And so I'm middle-aged and I still don't have a diagnosis. And I have like, today I'm feeling a lot of rage. <laughs> I'm just sharing that. But like, because I can't go to, like, I have these issues that are all the things and I don't have a doctor. I, brought, I think I brought up a couple of weeks ago, but I mean, I think that there is this, like, to even, I don't think most people understand even talking, like, internally, there's been a huge shift. I feel so much better. Everything makes sense. But going out into the neurotypical world at this point in the medical system and others, I find it still very frustrating. <laughs> like, the, and I, you know, I don't want to educate everyone. I go into psychoeducation mode in every single, and I find constantly like, you're not, that's a misdiagnosis. You're not this, you're not that. But I can't say that all the time. <laughs> and so I find myself enraged by our medical system on a near daily basis. So just protecting my nervous system from not flipping out <laughs> is kind of a daily effort. So. <laughs> And like suicidality, for example, is something that I've been looking at recently. And the numbers are just out of sight. And when you look at people who actually have autistic traits as opposed to diagnoses, I think it would be way, way higher. So again, we're just not addressing those issues as a society. And for a day like for a month like this, I don't hear that conversation. I don't hear the 2E conversation at all. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Heather. Right, um, you know, the, the healthcare system is broken. It doesn't work for a lot of people. And for some people, it can make the difference between life and death. And it's terrifying that that's not part of what gets talked about in April or ever. One of the ways that I got into figuring this out was when the pandemic hit, I hit Twitter really hard and I have a really great Twitter feed or I used to like back when it was a decent social media site, if you curated your feed really well. Um, and there was this autistic woman on there who just kept tweeting about, wouldn't it be, she's like, she said something like if all the INFJs and all the HSPs got together in a room, wouldn't they be stunned to figure out they're all autistic? And I was like, <clears throat> And that's how my journey started. And one of the things that this woman tweets about, I think it's L. Ancona or something, Lauren Ancona, is her absolute rage at people like Simon Baron Cohen, who did all this research based on the extremely, you know, stereotypical young boy, like model of autism and like literally women like her and women like me or non-binary people like me and folks like Heather just get totally, completely overlooked for their whole lives because of these guys' research decisions. So you're not alone for what it's worth. Her rage is incandescent and very validating. Yeah, and, and, and I think like naming, naming that, like naming that rage and knowing you're not alone in it 
um, because society also tells you that you're not supposed you're not supposed to feel certain ways, which is of course ridiculous. Thanks, Jenny Weaver. Hey, ah, uh, this is um, this is always so nervous. managed to miss everything last month. So I'm like sucking it up this month to make up for it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those, you know, there, our generation, it didn't exist, especially if you look like a little girl and <laughs> you were just a weird tomboy out on the playground. And, um, you know, like I've, I've, the weirdness of my brain is something that everyone made very apparent to me at a very young age. <laughs> and, um, but like with all the things, like I was just talking about this with my partner who's currently going through um, craniosacral training and, I'm, and I am actually not diagnosed yet, technically, <clears throat> not that I care, but um, I did go to a doctor for the first time in 35 years um, last month because I I also have hypermobile EDS, like so many of us. And um, I had to step away from Western medicine by the time I was 14, because I knew they would kill me. I knew that they would kill me. Um, uh, with my EDS, like it showed up so young and so systemically and they didn't know what to do with me and they kept throwing things at it and I'm allergic to all the medicines. So it was just like, 35 years of me trying to manage this on my own with herbs and whatever else, literally whatever else I can figure out and um, getting, getting the EDS diagnosis now on top of the autism thing. It's like, okay, so it's all the connective tissue is different. We're fundamentally different humans and no wonder it has been so challenging. <laughs> So like the rage is valid, like it really, the system is not designed for us and, and will, it would have killed me. Um, I think a lot of us uh, barely survive it. Um, and, and that, you know, that like right individualism, part of that is, you know, <laughs> trauma, <laughs> please. <laughs> like I just have to take care of it myself because yeah, yeah, it's, I appreciate that, that now it's, um, there's a community, there are these discussions, these conversations, but it has been a long life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And you are so not alone. Like that's the, that's the story. That's what people like in our medical practice, like that's the story that people tell. It's like, I, I have all the things I've had all the things for decades and the system has hurt me. Mm -hmm. And, and I've had to like try to figure it out on my own because the system is either dismissing and validating actively harming. Um, mm -hmm. That's, and what you, the way that you, at the, at, at the end there, Weaver, when you said that, um, you know, with different connective tissue, like it is not known by the majority of healthcare providers that autistic people have different physiology. That is not part of medical education. Right. And, and, and we have this healthcare system that makes this like re this bogus distinction between physical health and mental health, despite the nervous system going to the whole body <laughs> um. yeah it would be funny if it weren't so horrible i'm glad you're here Time for one more sharing, if anybody would like to. Yeah, so Alex has asked are there resources to learn about how the biology or physiology is different for autistic folks. Yeah, I'm gonna re-put in the chat a link that I posted a little bit ago. 
Um, we try to make our links like rememberable and then I spell them wrong. Okay, all the things. Um, so that is a project that All Brains Belong um, uh, in, in collaboration with 100 of our autistic and ADHD community members um, uh, had a, 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 a project about this very topic about the constellation of intertwined medical conditions that are so common for autistic and ADHD people. Um, and so there's resources, there's videos, there's text, there's graphics, there's all kinds of stuff there. There's also like a 16 page management guide. So I hope that's helpful. And we'll have a little bit, a, a little bit of that will come up at, at our uh, webinar on the 16th. So with that, I really, really appreciate all of you being here and thank you all for sharing. Thank you again to our panelists and uh, thank you all for being part of our community. And we'll look forward, um, this is like a, a, good, a good segue to next week's Brain Club. We'll be revisiting the healthcare challenges that autistic people face. We'll be hearing from our community panelists, um, and I'm 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 sh I'm sure the the themes of of all the things will um uh, will build right on this very conversation. So thank you all so much. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye.